Thank you, praise team. Just appreciate your ministry. It's so good to get together with the body of Christ, isn't it? And just sing praises to the Lord together. Um, it just starts the day off right, you know. I, I never feel like I can preach unless we've had a worship time before that. Just stand up and talk. I don't know. We need to prepare our hearts. I have a couple of quick things I want to say. Um, not related to the message, okay? Um, first of all, we have a in fall time. And people are going to be getting, begin coming home from vacations, and et cetera, et cetera. And we have a couple of uh, ministries that are starting up. One of them is Crossover. And Crossover is a young adult ministry for those young people out of high school and on up into their 20s. And, and um, it's going to start next Sunday upstairs in the upper room. And, and um, so and Matt Lindley is going to be leading that. It's going to be uh, studying the Word of God up there together as young people. So young people, I encourage you to uh, get involved in that. Next week, Brad is going to make an announcement because we have the coolest ministry in this church that nobody knows about. Not the same thing because you're going to announce it next week. But we have a cool, cool ministry going on with fourth, fifth, and sixth grade boys. We also have a cool ministry with the girls, too, but, but um, Brad has something special going with the boys. And, um, and if you have a fourth, fifth, or sixth grade young man or a neighbor, um, invite them. This is going to be, you're, you're going to enjoy this particular ministry. And then the church picnic in two weeks. Um, we need people to sign up for side dishes, but we need people to sign up for cleanup. And guys, I know that you can clean up too because you guys did a wonderful job after the men's breakfast yesterday. And we had a great, great time. Um, sharing together, learning together, worshiping together, and be, being together, eating together. It was, a, it was a great time. And thanks to all those that helped out. But a couple of people I want to introduce today. Let, let's see. I don't know where, where you are, all are. I know where you are, so I'll start right over here. Um, it is uh, Chris and Rachel, would you just stand up a moment? You had your had a baby. And you brought your little baby. Emory, Emory, Emory character. Welcome. We, we appreciate contributing to the growth of our church, okay? You can have a seat. Let's see. And I heard that G.D. Ricoma had a grandchild. <laughs> and so, um, Kalani and Tony, would you stand up? And you brought your baby, Rocky. <laughs> Congratulations. We always welcome new folks to our church, especially little tiny babies. That's so wonderful. Turn up in your Bibles to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, the part that we're in now. Now it all goes together. John is talking to us about gifts that Jesus wants to give to his loved ones. And four specific <laughs> gifts are in our text, and I'll get to that in a moment. But you know, I think one of the most difficult times of life are lonely times in life. I don't like to be lonely. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be alone. Presence, presence, just presence is such an important thing. I don't necessarily need my wife to always be talking to me about something. I just like her presence. I enjoy her presence. And she mine. And to just be together. That's like a very significant part of life. Friends. Relatives. Loved ones of all kinds. Just presence with them. Many years ago, I had come, I had entered the ministry and had um, in the denomination I was with, I had to go through a lot of work in order to get ordained. You were licensed when you stepped into your first church, but not ordained. And in order to get ordained, it took about two years. You had an awful lot of work to do, books that had to be read, reports that had to be submitted. And then there was a point after two years and ten theological books that you had to report on where the ordaining committee would call you in for a oral examination. And so I was called in. The ordaining committee met at their headquarters, the denomination's headquarters, about 200 miles from my house. And of course, I had three young children at that time and my wife. 
And so I got my car and I drove 200 miles to meet with the ordaining council. That's a big, big deal in a pastor's life when you get ordained, officially get ordained. And I got to tell you, I went in and I sat before a group of about six crusty, <laughs> old, <laughs> learned, experienced, wise, tough, old men, much like myself today. <laughs> but I was 24 years old and shaking in my shoes. And for two hours, they cross-examined me on every fine point of Scripture. Um, and, and I've told you before, but, but I remember coming to a point where one of the old wise men looked at me and said, Describe God. <laughs> I just melted with that, okay? But finally, the two hours was done. They sent me out, they sat and discussed, they called me in, they said we're pleased to announce that we are placing our blessing of ordination upon you. Well, so an ordination service was planned in my church a couple of weeks later, but I remember walking out of there, and it was like the best thing that ever happened to me in my entire life. Guess who was there to tell? Nobody. Nobody. I was just alone. I couldn't tell anybody. It wasn't a cell phone day. I, I couldn't like text met, or I, I couldn't FaceTime my wife, you know. Um, th th there was no way of contacting. I had to drive 200 miles. I thought, I'm going to go celebrate. And so I thought, man, I would just love a steak dinner. So I went out and ordered chicken because I couldn't afford steak. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it was just like an empty meal. There I was in the restaurant celebrating all by myself with no one to share with. Now, of course, when I got home, it was a great, great celebration with my wife and then with the church, and it was a wonderful time, but I'll never forget the loneliness of the occasion. Have you been watching the Olympics? Oh, yes. I've been watching the Olympics, um, and, and Joy and I have been watching them together and enjoying them. One of my favorite parts of the Olympics is when the, the competitors look up into the stands and the camera goes up and there's their husband or there's their wife or or with Michael Phelps there's this tiny little baby with those earphones on you know so he can't hear um, other relatives that are there well what's what's the purpose of those people going to Rio de Janeiro for the Olympics presence presence to bring a little piece of home along with you we used to in back in the wallet days when men carried wallets we would carry pictures of our wife and our kids and show them off to people. We carried a little piece of home with us. Now, now we have, I don't have it with me, but we have cell phones. We have like, what, like, like whole albums of pictures. <laughs> if you got the time, I can show you my life story right there on my, on my phone. Every relative I ever knew and liked, and the rest of them too, okay? And, and, and we, we like a piece of home with us. We like to be present with those that we love. Jesus is just hours, minutes away from his death. And he's telling the disciples, I'm going away. In a little while, you won't see me anymore. And although Jesus would no longer be visibly present with the eleven, the eleven, and by extension us, would not be left alone. Jesus promised gifts. He promised gifts of presence for those that love him. And four times, by the way, in our text, it talks about those that love him. I want you to understand that what our text is talking about today are gifts for those who love Jesus. These are not gifts that belong to the outsiders. They're not gifts that belong to the world. These are gifts that Jesus is giving to his family, his loved ones, his beloved. They are special. They're special for you. They're special for us. They're special for all God's children through all the ages around the globe. Praise the Lord. And he promised four permanent sources of power and comfort. Number one, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. 
But number two, the presence of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number three, the presence of the Holy Father. It's interesting, if you ever wonder where does the Bible talk about the Trinity, well, here's one of the many places right here in our text. Spirit, Son, and Father, all mentioned right together, and all present with us. And number four, the presence of the truth, that Jesus promised that the truth would always be with us. Four gifts that he gives to those that love him. Let's read about it. If you'd stand together with me, John chapter 14. <clears throat> John chapter 14, starting in verse 15 and through verse 26, Jesus said, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor, it says in my Bible. Yours, it might say advocate, it might say comforter. To be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the rest of the world? And Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And he who, does, he who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the wonder of your presence. We thank you that you do not leave us. You do not abandon us. You do not forsake us. You do not leave us alone. And Lord, I pray that as your children who love you and are loved by you, that we would live in the glorious presence. That we forget, never forget, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whatever we're saying, Every place we are, whether we're asleep or awake, home or traveling, we're in the presence of the God who loves us. Bless our time in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. So there's four things in our text here. Number one is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, and Jesus has promised, has promised to give them the Holy Spirit. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. And he will be with you, how long? Forever. Never absent. Now there are three key words, folks. There are three key words right here in our text. The first one is the Greek word parakletos. Parakletos. It's, a, it's a, not a difficult word to translate, but it's a it's a, a full, abundantly full word that just one single English word is never quite adequate to describe all that's encompassed within it. Take the English word love, for instance. That, that is a plump, full word, is it not, okay? And parakletos is a plump, full word. There's a, a, a lot of ways it can be translated. That's why just about every translation uses a little bit different word, and they're all kind of hinting at part of it, but no English word captures the whole of it. It literally means one who comes alongside, an advocate, a helper, a counselor, a comforter, an encourager, an intercessor. It means all of those things. Jesus said, Jesus said, I am going to send another counselor to be with you forever. 
You see, I'm not going to leave you helpless. I'm not going to leave you abandoned. I'm not going to leave you discouraged. I'm not going to leave you troubled. I'm not going to leave you confused. I'm not going to leave you lost in a world that you don't really belong in because you're citizens of another world just traveling through this world. I'm going to send a guide. I'm going to send one to be with you. I'm going to send one to show you the way that will always be by your side, that will always have his arm around you, that will provide you comfort in your times of distress, that will provide you counsel in your times of confusion, that it will provide you encouragement in, in, your, in, your, in your times that you're discouraged and forlorn and weary. I'm going to send an intercessor who's going to be praying for you every moment of every day. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to you. The second word is just a simple word, alas. Alas in the Greek. And it means another. But it's an extremely significant word when it shows up in the Bible. And it shows up in the Bible a lot of times along with another word for another, okay? The word alas means another of the same kind. Sometimes in the Gospels, we can be reading about the disciples fishing and there's another boat. It means another boat of the same kind. When Peter denied Jesus, first there was a servant and then there was another servant. It means another of the same kind. Jesus' disciples are referred to as disciples. But every once in a while they'll run into someone else, whether it's John's disciples earlier on, or whether it's another person that is, that is ministering. And, and it, the word another, a loss, means another of the same kind. But there's a heteros word in the Greek, and it means another of a different kind, another of a different nature. Um, Matthew talks about it when he first is talking about a Jew, and then he says another man, and the word in the Greek is, is heteros. It means another of a different kind. It's in reference to a Samaritan in that, in that text. Um, Paul talks about there is a law at work within me, and it's the, it's the spirit. It's the life that comes from the Holy Spirit of God. But he says, unfortunately, I'm living in the flesh. I'm living in a fallen world. I'm struggling. I struggle every day. And he says, there's another law at work within me. It's the law of sin. And he uses the word heteros, another of a different kind. So when Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit, folks, that word another is a very important word because it means another of the same kind. Jesus is saying, I'm sending the Holy Spirit to you. And when you read the Gospels and you see the nature of Jesus throughout the Gospels, I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit is with you and the Holy Spirit is just like Jesus. It is Jesus. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Another of the same kind as Jesus was to his disciples, the Holy Spirit is to you. As Jesus was to the crowds, the Holy Spirit is to you. As Jesus reached out and touched lepers with a heart of compassion, the Holy Spirit reaches out and touches your leprous heart with a heart of compassion, with the heart of Jesus. So parakletos, one who comes alongside. Elos, another of the same kind. The third word is, is the word aletheia in the Greek, and it just means truth. But understand that all, the, we, we use the word absolute truth, and I've said this before, absolute truth is a redundancy. Because if truth is an absolute, it's not true. Therefore, all truth is absolute. Are you following that? Okay. So, truth, the spirit of truth, aletheia, this word can be counted on. The ministry of the Holy Spirit through the word of God is truth. Truth and all truth. How much of this Bible do we believe? All of it. Where do we start believing it? Genesis 1. And all the way through to Revelation 22, 21. God's word is truth. Jesus said, John 17, 17, Sanctify them with your word. Thy word is truth. The Holy Spirit of truth. The presence of the Spirit with us. Literally, the word truth means that which is un unclosed or unhidden, that which is true in any matter under consideration. This book is true in every issue to which it speaks. 
this word is true. Think of it. This word is true on all matters to which it speaks, whether it be science, whether it be history, whether it be matters of faith or matters of practice. This word is true. Amen. Praise the Lord. I've been asked to teach a um, college course on Testament history. And, and so I've been reading through the textbook. And, and I, I, every once in a while I put a frowny face <laughs> in the margin. And I told Joy, real biblical scholars don't become textbook writers. Okay? And every once in a while they come up with something that just ain't so. <laughs> just is not true. Uh, the, the most recent thing that I've been on was um, they, they make a reference to the Ark of the Covenant. If you remember in the Old Testament, Eli sent the Ark of the Covenant into battle against the Philistines. The Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. Next thing, they're all sick. So they get a brand new cart, a couple blocks, and they have the Ark taken back. And the authors of the textbook say the Ark stayed in Jerem for 20 years. Okay, well, the ark got captured before Saul became king, and Saul was king for 40 years, and David brought the ark from Kirith Jerem to Jerusalem in the seventh year of his monarchy. So we have at least 47 years. So the 20 years can't be true. Okay, but when you go into the text, it says they, that the ark arrived in Kirith Jerem where it stayed for 20 years. And so how do you justify the time frame and what it says there, and what it's saying is, if you think through it, it was there for 20 years, and then this happened. It wasn't saying it was 20 years, and then it left, okay? The word is true, and the word is always true. And sometimes we look at it, and we say, well, that looks confusing, or that looks contradictory. And the, the, the issue is oftentimes that we've not studied deep enough, we've not thought hard enough, we've not examined it thoroughly enough. The word is true, and we have to start with that as a presupposition. The word is true on every issue to which it speaks. You see, there's a relationship of the Holy Spirit to the world that's different from the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the believer. Very important for us to understand. Our text brings this out. In verse 17, we, under, we, we get an understanding of the relationship of the Holy Spirit to an unholy world. Number one, it says the world can't accept the Holy Spirit. You see, I can use the Holy Spirit as my argument for righteous behavior. Why are you doing that? Because the Holy Spirit ministered this to me from the Word. And the world says, what Holy Spirit? The world doesn't accept the Holy Spirit, and Jesus said that they wouldn't. Number two, the world can't see the Holy Spirit. Because to the world, in a lot of issues, unless it's tangible and they can hold it in their hand, they say it's not real. Well, that is until it comes to things that are 65 million years old and things like that, okay? Then, then they come up with all kinds of things. But the world cannot see him, and so the world doesn't accept him. And number three, the world does not know or have a personal relationship with him. The word know, gnosis, is a relationship knowledge. Not just to know of, but to know in an intimate manner. So the world can't accept the Holy Spirit, the world can't see the Holy Spirit, and the world doesn't know the Holy Spirit. But the relationship between the Holy Spirit and you is entirely different. Praise the Lord. And our text tells us in the second part of that verse that the Holy Spirit lives with you. Present tense in the Greek, right now, today. Amen. Praise the Lord. In your greatest fear, right then. In the midst of your greatest trouble, right then. In the midst of your most wonderful, happy experience, right then. In the midst of your biggest temptation, right then. The Holy Spirit is with you, present tense, always with you and never gone. Number two, it says he will be in you. Literally, it says in the text, I will be in you. Jesus is really pointing to the fact of the Godhead, Spirit and Son are one and the same. He will be in you. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is looking forward and looking ahead to the coming of the Holy Spirit. But the coming of the Holy Spirit was a time of empowerment. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. 
The Holy Spirit is present, empowering His people. Praise the Lord. You come to those times in life where the trouble seems so big, the difficulty so immense, the struggle so overwhelming. Never forget that the empowerment of the Holy Spirit abides in you. That same Spirit, wrote the Apostle Paul, that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. That life-giving Spirit that raised Jesus up is the life-giving Spirit that lives in you and is there for you. The one who comes alongside of you puts his arm around you, the counselor, the guide, and he's with you and he's with you always. The second gift is the gift of the Son. The presence of the Son. Jesus says in verse 18, I'm going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That gives us a great understanding of what the function of the Holy Spirit is in the New Testament church. The function of the Holy Spirit is is to continue the presence and the ministry of Jesus Christ today. You see, Jesus walked the dusty roads of Judea and Galilee. The Holy Spirit walks the dusty roads of the entire earth. The Holy Spirit is in this church, and that church, and that church, and every church, and over at the gas station, and at the grocery store, and everywhere else. You cannot be absent from His Spirit. The psalmist wrote, where can I go? Where can I go to get away from you? God, I can't. Whether I'm on the top of the highest mountain or in the depths of Death Valley. You're there. You are there with me. The Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you as an orphan. It's a reference to His resurrection, first and foremost. Jesus is coming back from the dead. But it's a reference to His union with the Spirit in the Godhead. There is one God, Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus said, go and baptize in the name, not names, name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's one God. The Spirit is God. The Son is God. Amen. The Father is God. Three manifestations, but one God. See, the world can't see him. They didn't see him after the... They, you know, do you realize that, that the, the Bible does not give us a reference to the world seeing Jesus after the resurrection? Jesus walked on, on the road with two from... On, on the road to Emmaus. And he taught them all things concerning him in the scriptures. Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room twice. Jesus appeared to Mary in the garden. And, the, and, and other women and other men saw him. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, 500 saw him on one occasion, but they were all believers. Jesus didn't appear to an unbelieving world. They didn't see him after the resurrection, and they can't see him now. But Jesus said, but you will see me. The Oreo. It's like Oreo the cookie. The Oreo. To see. See, it's not the normal Greek word for see. The normal Greek word for see is the word blopo. Blopo. I can see Randy. Blopo. Okay. But fiorio is a deeper relational word, okay? It's a word that tells us I perceive, I understand. I connect with. I'm present with. I don't just see. I'm one with. And Jesus is going to get to that in a moment. It's a relational term that Jesus is giving us. You will see me. Praise the Lord. You see, I can't blood bowl Jesus today. But I can theorize Jesus today. And I know that he's with me. And I know that he's in me. And I know that he's beside me. And I know that he's around me. And I know I can talk to him. And I know I can walk with him. Amen. And I know he cares. See, this is the mystery that God hit, folks. 
Jesus said, I'm in the Father. Jesus said, I'll send you the Holy Spirit and I'll be with you. Now Jesus says, I'm in the Father. And you are in me. And I am in you. I need you to catch the profoundness of this. Because this is amazingly profound. Don't just read through this and miss the depth. Jesus is making a point. And the point is this. As the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is inseparably united. Inseparably united. The Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we are inseparably united with Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Wow. Praise the Lord. Wow. Amen. Jesus can't leave me. Nothing can take Jesus away from me. That's why Paul wrote, what can separate me from the love of God? Not height, not depth, not width, not anything. As Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, and you can't separate them. Jesus is one with us, united, inseparable with Him forever. He's one with me. He's in me. The presence. Live in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Live in the presence of Jesus, who loves you died for you and welcomes you as his own. The third thing is the presence of the Father. Sometimes in our minds we think of the Holy Spirit as the one with us. Jesus is the one who was evident in 2,000 years ago in Israel. And the Father is the way out there, God. Jesus is saying, no, that's wrong thinking. You see, Jesus came back to the subject that he started with in the text, verse 21. He said, if you love me, obey me. That's going to be a test. If you love me, obey me. Only those in obedience to Christ are in union with Christ. Well, what, what exactly does that mean? Is that describing our salvation? No, not the cause of our salvation, the result of our salvation. See, there's a big difference. The cause of our salvation is that Jesus gave himself to die for our sins to make payment that we might be redeemed through his blood. And we must what? <coughs> Believe. Believe. That's it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe, believe, believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. What's the result <coughs> of believing? Obedience. 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 But there's a guy sitting there named Judas. Not Iscariot. He's gone. This disciple is known as Thaddeus in, the, in some of the other Gospels. Occasionally, different places he comes up with the name Thaddeus. He's still sitting there. Peter, he's silent now. James, Philip, they've all had things to say. Thaddeus finally speaks up. And he's still assuming that Jesus is returning to establish an earthly kingdom and defeat Rome. So he's confused. Because he's sitting there thinking, wait a minute, if Jesus is going to come and set up a monarchy in the line of David, the Messiah, Jesus, is going to have to be evident to the whole world, not just to those that love him. So that concerns him. He's confused. He wonders why this is going to be. So for the third time, Jesus links obedience with genuine love for him. And I want you to catch this. Because this may be, I always hesitate to say something that's the most important part of the whole passage because it's all important, okay? But this is amazing to me. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now let me ask you a question. Where is God's home? 
You see, John chapter 14, verse 1 uses the same word. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Verse 2. In my Father's home. Same word. Same word in the Greek. In my Father's home are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also. So Jesus told us that God has a home. We think of that home as heaven. Praise the Lord. But now Jesus tells us something even more amazing. Because I look forward to the day, I look forward to the day when I'm going to go home. But in the meantime, guess where God's home is today? Right here. In His people. Underline that in your Bible. We will come to Him and make our home with Him. God, the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They make their home in you, folks. Where is God's home? It's sitting right there in Tommy. It's sitting right there in Paul. It's sitting right there in Penn. Not just picking on the pen. It's sitting right there in you two ladies. It's in us. God makes his home in us. My Father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. Wow. So then I think, I think about the Olympians going off to Rio. And they take their mom, their dad, brothers and sisters, husbands, wives, children. So they have a little piece of home with them. God makes his home with us right now, today. Not just where we will be one day for all eternity. Yes, the Father has a home and we will be in his home today. But today, his home is in us. Praise the Lord. You see, Jesus is saying, if you love me and keep my word, my Father and I will come to you in all your suffering, in all your trials. We'll come to you and give you heaven on earth. We've prepared a dwelling for you in heaven. We are that dwelling. If you love me and keep my word, we will come and be that dwelling for you right now. A piece of heaven on earth. A piece of heaven here today. A piece of my eternal home with me today. What an incredible thought. Praise the Lord. And then Jesus says, the fourth gift is the presence of truth. You see, up until now, Jesus had taught them truth. Jesus had been their source of truth. Jesus gave them an understanding of the scriptures, which when Jesus referred to the scriptures was the Old Testament. He gave them a proper understanding as they had never received before. Jesus said, you have heard it has been said, but I say unto you, this is, this is what it's talking about. Just as Jesus would not leave them without a source of comfort. He wouldn't leave them without a source of truth. You want to know why Christian thinking is so contrary to world thinking? Because we have Jesus. Because we have a source of truth with Jesus. Because he's given us the Holy Spirit of truth. Because he's given us his word that is true. Because we're a different people. Because we don't belong in this world. It's not where our citizenship is. It's like an athlete in Rio. It's a different culture. It's a different language. It's a different way of life. Everything's different. They're just a passing through. This world isn't our home. God makes his home with us temporarily right here. But he has an eternal home with us forever and forever and forever. And we look at things from that mindset, a mindset of the spirit, the presence of the spirit of truth within us. 
You see, apart from divine revelation, there's no way, there is no way to know spiritual truth. That's why there's so many different religions in the world. Because people come up with their own religions. They come up with their own belief systems. The word is true. And the word is the only truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way. There's no other way. You know, before Pentecost, even the disciples, I mean, the disciples sat right there at the Passover meal listening to the words of Jesus. And they found all these things hard to understand. At the beginning of John 2.22, we read after he raised, was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. And then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. See, it wasn't until after the resurrection it dawned on them. Oh, wow. This is true. John 12, 16. It says at first his disciples didn't understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. It was after the ascension. They realized when the Holy Spirit came on them in power that all things Jesus said were so, were true. All things the scripture reported is true. John 16. In a few weeks we'll get to this. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he'll guide you into all truth and he'll not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. Folks, the spirit of truth is with us. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit is with us. Jesus the Son is with us. God the Father is with us. And truth is with us. It abides with us. It teaches us. So I'm going to give you five life applications from our text. Number one, the Holy Spirit is present today. He's present with you. Wherever you are, you cannot flee from His presence. You cannot escape it. He ain't going to get lost. And you're not going to get lost. He comes alongside to help and comfort and encourage and intercede on our behalf. Number two, the nature of the Holy Spirit is the nature of Jesus. You want to understand the Holy Spirit? Understand Jesus. The Spirit is another of the same kind. Loving, caring, compassionate. What do you need from him today? He has that for you. Praise the Lord. What's your struggle? He's with you. What's your hurt? He has healing all available for you. Number three, Jesus is as real and present today as he was with the disciples on earth. I will come to you. I am in. Jesus is as present here. Jesus is as present in you as Jesus was present on the dusty roads of Galilee. Praise the Lord. Number four, in our Father's home are many rooms. Jesus is preparing an eternal place for us. But now, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God makes his home with us, in us. And number five, the Holy Spirit is our resident truth teacher. You want to know the way or you work? Pray. Open your heart to the Holy Spirit. Get into the things of God. Because God has sent the Holy Spirit to be your resident truth teacher. Now let me just give you one last picture. Remember the Old Testament? Israel escaped Egypt and they went out into the desert where God gave instructions for the building of the tabernacle. <laughs> Once the tabernacle was built, the Spirit of God descended upon the tabernacle and dwelt there. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that, that God was present in the form of fire by night and smoke by day. You see, the Jews of the Old Testament the tabernacle wasn't a place of worship like a church is today. It was a place that reminded them that God was right in their midst. Right in their midst. Three tribes to the east, three to the west, three to the north, three to the south. God was in their presence. You ever think about what's the difference between the tabernacle and the temple? 
See, the tabernacle was a temporary dwelling place of God. The temple was permanent. The tabernacle represented God's temporary presence, the temple, God's permanent dwelling place. You see, in heaven, there's a temple of God, not a tabernacle. But even more than that, in John chapter 1, so in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and verse 14, and the Word became flesh. In the Greek, it says that the Word became flesh, and and our Bible says, dwelt among us. In the Greek, the Word became flesh and tabernacle among us. Why? Because Jesus' physical presence on earth was temporary. But then in the Corinthians and in the New Testament, other places, we read, you are the what? The temple. You're not a tabernacle. You're a temple. You're the temple of God. Why? Because God is permanently in you. God is never leaving you. He's never abandoning you. He's never going away. You're a temple, folks, an eternal temple. Is that awesome? Dwell in the presence. Because the presence dwells in you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the wonder of your word. Thank you for the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word that is the truth. Sanctify us with your word. Thy word is truth. And Lord, we, may we never doubt the presence of Almighty God. The indwelling presence, the surrounding presence, the protective presence, the awesome presence. And that it's permanent forever, for all eternity. How we thank you for the gifts given to those that love you. May we enjoy the holiness, the wonder, the awesome.